Om Namah Shivaya. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be back and to be able to uh, talk on pain tonight. So it's uh, a topic that uh, we actually don't really talk a whole lot about. And, and uh, as you heard, I get, to be, I get to teach at a university in Canada. And one of, the, one of the things that we've often talked about around pain is what we really need is have a course on pain. And in the course, all you would need to do is think about what you think about pain. And that's sort of what I'm going to try to get you to do tonight, a little bit of but think about pain, but to think about more from, um, I'm going to share with you more about the, the biological look of it or the physiological look of it. Um, there's so many scholars here who can talk to you about the yoga work um, who know more about that than I do, so I'll stick with this. Although often when I, I teach in the physical therapy and medical world, and I teach a lot to people in pain as well, um, a lot of the time I'm actually trying to tell them about yoga. Um, but tonight we'll sort of veer over onto this other side. And uh, I, I really need to, need to thank you, Sri Devi, for inviting me back down and for the wonderful talk last night, because it really helped me segue into this. And uh, one of the things I didn't realize is that one of the things that I'm actually doing most of the time when I'm talking to people about pain is I'm trying to teach them about the nature of pain. So as you heard last night is that it, when we are suffering or when there's disease or illness, what we need is uh, we need to understand ourselves, but we also need to understand the nature of the thing that's affecting us, and we need to understand the nature of the things that we would use to try to get better. And so uh, yoga helps you with those two ends. Uh, it also helps you to understand the nature of pain. Uh, but uh, maybe understanding a little bit more about the biology of it will help you sort of move forward a little bit more in understanding it. So uh, have you had a paper cut before? Yes. Yeah. So when you have a paper cut, how much uh, damage is there to your body? Not much, right? So when you have a paper cut, how much pain can there be? A lot. So what does that tell you about pain? A lot of people say, well, that tells you that pain is not always related specifically to the damage that you have in your body or that they don't you know, exactly correlate. And that'd be true, but what I would say to you is it's something, this tells us something much more important, and it tells us that pain is complex. Now, I know you know that when you sit and think about it, but it's really under important for us to keep on coming back to this idea. And, and I come back to it a lot because part of my job is to help people uh, understand pain more, which means part of my job is to simplify it. But I'm standing in front of you trying to simplify something that's vastly complex, and I want you to keep on coming back to that idea as we talk about this. Um, so researchers being the way they are, uh, oh, I should mention too, I'm, I'm a research geek. I read scientific research about pain all the time. Um, and researchers actually did a study where they looked at, do people say that paper cuts hurt more at work or more at home? <laughs> and so what peop most people said was they hurt more at work, which once again tells you what about pain? It's complex, right? There's a lot of things that, that are aspect to this. So, um, so I'm going to to try to lighten this as we talk about this, but uh, I guess one of the things I want to ma mention to you is that uh, the work that I do is working with people who have, have really complex pain. So yes, we can talk about pain that we experience when we do yoga, um, and we can talk about you know the, the sort of normal pains in life, but I work with people whose pain is so bad that they consider suicide or do commit suicide because the pain is that bad, or people whose pain is so bad that they self-amputate a part of their body that's, that's that in that much pain. So this is a huge, really, really horrible problem. I mean, we think that 20% of people in, in Western societies have, have constant, daily, moderate to severe pain. I mean, that's a big number, 20%. So the, the social burden of this is huge, and the financial burden of it's big as well. So um, I think what's really wonderful, too, is that uh, not only is the research starting to show us that one of the most effective treatments for people who have chronic pain, regardless of the kind of chronic pain, is yoga. I mean, the, the practice of yoga, um, what I learned was, you know, because I, I started as a physical therapist and then started to meditate and, and then started to learn yoga and started to realize that most of the things that we were doing in these pain management centers looked a whole lot like yoga. It just wasn't that kind of language, right? So um, I'll try to tell you a little bit more about that. So uh, if you were to finish this sentence, just think for yourself, if you finish the sentence, pain is blank, what would you say? It's painful, that's good. <laughs> you know, I don't know if anyone's ever said that before. Yeah, okay, so it's painful, yeah. But it's a lot of things, right? Pain is uh, complex, as we've said. Pain's invisible. Uh, you, you hear that pain is inevitable. Uh, pain is uh, 
uh, a teacher. Pain is the enemy. Pain is your friend. You know, you could just keep on going on. Awful, yeah, horrible. Um, I think the thing to, to realize is that when we say that, what we have to come up with, if we were to answer this or consider this, this idea, is that maybe we should stop thinking about pain as a noun and start to think that pain is a verb. Right? Pain is a process, right? It's a biological, physiological, psychological thing, spiritual thing. It's, it's, but we tend to, what we want to try to do is make, these, make something like pain into this very, you know, put it in a box and define it. There's actually a group called the International Association for the Study of Pain. They've been around for a long time, and they've defined pain, which I think is a little bit odd, because if you look at, uh, well, there have been people who have been writing about pain forever, and those people would be yogis, right? But there's also poets who have been writing about pain forever, right? But the, medical, the Western medical community has come along and decided that we're going to explain pain, we're going to define it really well. But all these other people have been trying to dis- talk about it forever and can't come up with an agreement, right? So think of it more as something that, that is uh, a moving target, that's changeable, that's not this thing that you can grab or even discuss it really well. So... Uh, this is something that I made up when I'm talking to medical uh, people to get their minds thinking a little bit different way. So pain is a troublesome human experience. I say it's human because not because animals don't have pain, but because our experience is a human experience. But this may be a better way to think about pain than most of the way that medical people do, um, is that it's a very, very complex thing. And if we could think of it less as a, just a medical problem, it might help. Anyway, so... How about this? What's the purpose of pain? What's it for? It's a signal, absolutely. So a lot of people, would, when I teach people in pain uh, this and I ask them this question, a lot of times I get this look like, well, that's a really s- sort of dopey question. You know, the purpose of pain is to tell you you've been, you've been damaged. Would that make some sense? Well, it's true, but it's not complete, right? That is something that it, it does, but it's not a complete answer. And so if we came up with a one-word answer, it would be this. The purpose of pain from a biological perspective is protection. Its job is to get you to either either stop your behavior or change your behavior. Does that make some sense? You ever been walking along and you smack your kneecap on something? So signals go flying from your kneecap on up through your body, up to your brain, and your brain gives you pain to get you to stop walking on your leg for a while. Right? That's the biological imperative of it. Everybody get that okay? But can you remember that experience? You've got this pain, but you decide you're going to walk on your leg anyway. So what does, what does this, this organism in which we live do when you try to do that? Well, it might give you more pain, but what it actually might do is it might find another way to stop you too. Would that make a little bit of sense? And this is one of the key things to understand is that if you have pain when you're moving around and you decide that you're just going to override it, a lot of what ha- times what happens is the systems of your body will actually act as if you're not listening. The systems of your body, if it's giving you a signal to try to get you to change your behavior, but you're not changing your behavior, it may decide to turn on another protective mechanism to stop you. And the complexity of this gets really amazing. And the people that that I work with sometimes, they'll end up with psoriasis. A person's got like a chronic low back problem, and all of a sudden they've got psoriasis in part of their body for no apparent medical reason. But psoriasis is thickening of the skin, and thickening of the skin is a protective mechanism. And so we have this this sort of theoretical premise that maybe that's what's causing this when there's no other medical reason. Did everybody get that okay? Yeah? Maybe I'll tell you a quick story. uh, We were working in, uh, I live in uh, British Columbia, Canada, and I used to work in in, uh, Vancouver. And there was this, this fellow who came in to see us. He was a logger, and he was cutting down this big tree. And when this big tree on the west coast fell down, there's a dead branch up top. As the tree's falling, the dead branch falls out of the tree at him and the other people he's working with. They all run to get out of the way, and they all made it, but he didn't. This big tree actually landed right on top of his body, and he ended up in an ICU for many months afterwards. But when he started to move around again afterwards, he found that if he stood long enough or if he walked long enough, his legs would give way. And so the doctors thought, well, if your legs are giving away, you must have pinched nerves. And you know, they, he said, I remember them saying to me you know, that, that when they, I first came in, they did an x-ray of my back and it looked okay, but they were convinced that if my legs were giving away, that it must be pinched nerves. So what they did was they did another x-ray of his back. And this is months later from the original injury, and now they can see that when the tree hit him, it actually broke his back in four spots. 
Do you know how bone can break but not displace? So in his lower back there, bone had broken and cracked, but it didn't displace. But now they can see that on the x-ray. So the point is there was an injury to his back. But when they looked at the x-ray, the x-ray showed that the holes that the nerves were all coming out in the spinal canal were all fine. But his legs were giving way, so they thought he must have pinched nerves and we just can't see it on an x-ray. So they then go on and do a CT scan, and the CT scan was okay, and then they did an MRI, and it was okay, and then they did a nerve conduction test, and it was okay, and then they did a brain scan because it had a concussion when it hit him, and it, that was okay too. And then what he remembers them saying is, there's nothing wrong with you, which made him really, really angry, as you can imagine, because his, his legs were giving away. Anyway, unfortunately, this is one of these workers' compensation things that didn't go all that well. And so he didn't actually get any care for almost one year after that. And at that end of the year, they sent him into our pain management center. And he came into the clinic, the angriest guy we'd ever seen. He was angry because he hadn't had care for a year. He was angry because he thought that they were telling him that there was nothing wrong with him. And he was angry at the sign on our door. So the sign said, Vancouver Pain Clinic. And he said, you people don't listen my problem is not pain. My problem is my legs give way. So anyway, I got to be his physical therapist, and, and I've been around loggers and miners a lot in my work. And so I asked him this sort of simple question as part of my assessment. said, you ever had back pain before? Now he looks at me like I'm the biggest idiot in the known universe. He says, I'm a logger. We all have back pain. I said, okay, when you're a logger and the back pain gets bad, what do you do? Do you take time off work? Do you go see the doctor? And he cuts me off and says, no, you don't not work just because you have a sore back. And so I said something like this. I said, so I think what you're trying to tell me is back pain won't stop you. Now this guy sits up tall in his chair and he gets his finger out and he says, that's exactly what I'm telling you. Are you guys getting this story? Right? This guy for years figured out how to take that pain. When he was feeling pain in his back, he figured out how to push it down, suppress it over and over and over again. But now he's got a new injury to his back. It's sending more signals up to his brain to try to get this to happen, but he is not listening. So what would a sophisticated protective mechanism, as in you, do if you don't listen to it? Find another way to stop you. That makes some sense? And I'm hoping, hoping that makes a little bit of sense in terms of when you feel pain in yoga, what should you do? But if you want to know more about that, we're going to talk about that tomorrow. That's going to be a focus of talk, talk tomorrow is more about the movement side. Anyway, so your body can protect you in lots of different ways. Pain is just one of the ways, and I'm sure you know these other ones. So it actually protects you with itch is another protective mechanism. Your body can protect you by making your muscles tight. It can protect you by making your muscles feel weak. It can protect you by changing your posture. It can protect you by causing emotions, right? Emotions aren't just protection, but it can do that. And it can also change the way you breathe. And this is just a few of them, right? This, this thing in which we live has amazing biological capacity to try to keep you alive, to keep you safe, right? And we un need to understand that pain is one, from a biological perspective, one of the ways that does that. So the pain system, there really isn't a pain system, but it's, it's easy to talk about it that way, uh, can be viewed as an alarm system, a really sophisticated one that can warn you when you've been damaged. It says cans in blue there, because it doesn't always, right? There's sometimes when you're damaged, but you don't feel pain. The system can warn you if you're approaching damage. So once again, usually before you actually injure your tissue, the body will say, hey, maybe you should stop now. But again, it doesn't always do that. And then it can do this. It can warn you if you're in a similar situation to a time in the past when you've needed to be protected. And it's really good at this. It's really, really good at remembering how to protect you. And But the best way to explain that would be to go outside the sort of normal pain area and, and uh, tell you a quick story. I, I grew up in... Uh, Kingston, Ontario, which is about halfway between Toronto and Montreal in Canada. And uh, I moved to Vancouver in 1997. When I moved, one of my friends from Toronto came to visit me, and she'd never had sushi, and she'd never had sake. And the same evening, she had far too much sushi and far too much sake. She now had this stuff in her stomach that her brain decided was dangerous and that she needed to be protected from it. And so it created quite an output. So she was sick for a day or two afterwards. But if we called her up on the phone right now, two decades later, and said the word sushi to her, she'd feel sick just thinking about it. So this is one episode of, of this organism in which we live protecting you, and potentially for the rest of your life, the thought of that thing you need to be protected from could turn on the protection mechanisms. Everybody get that okay? This is one of the reasons why it's really hard to change pain when it persists is because the protection mechanisms can practice over and over and over again and get really good at protecting you. 
All right, so to understand pain, we need to understand the nervous systems a little bit, so I want to tell you quickly about the, uh, some ways about the nervous systems, uh, the way they work. But I guess where I want the, the key point that this slide is trying to get to you is that the nervous systems are adaptable. They're always changing. They're changing your whole life. Like right now, your nerves are changing. It's just the way it is. And I make a big deal about this because when I was in university, so back in about 1983, our neurophysiology professor said to us, past the age of 27, your brain doesn't change much anymore. The professor said it, so we all just sort of believed it and didn't think about it. And of course, I'm hoping that when you hear me say that, you're thinking, really, you guys were that, that dopey that you thought that? I mean, come on, this thing is changing our whole lives, right? Everything in our body has the capacity to change until we're not alive anymore. So anyway, it's adaptable, which is good news. All right, so that's not what a nerve cell looks like, but it's to give us an idea of what nerve cells are like. They're these wiry things. They're so small that you can't see it. The nerves that are in the pain system that, that send danger signals from your body to your brain, if you can think of the thinnest hair fiber that you could detect with your eye, that would be about 10,000 times thicker than one of the nerves in this that work around sending you danger signals. Or that thin, thin hair fiber you could see, that would be a bundle of at least 10,000 of those neurons. So they're that tiny, but they can be really long because there are nerve cells that start in your big toe and the other end of them is all, up, all the way up in your spinal cord. Strangely enough, there are some nerve cells that go from your toe up to your spinal cord and part of them continues to go up all the way to your thalamus in, at the base of your brain. So there are some nerve cells that are super long, even though they're really, really tiny. Anyway, every nerve cell has sensors down at the bottom, and the sensors down at the bottom get excited by something. They'll send an electrical message way faster than those little animations are showing you there um, up to the other end of that nerve. They send signals at up to about 120 meters a second, so pretty much instantaneous from one end of the nerve to the other as far as we're concerned. So if that was a sensor in your eye, what would the sensors get excited by? Light. And if it was a sensor in your ear, they'd get excited by vibration. Yeah? Everybody okay with that? So how about the sensors that had to do with pain? What are the, there are three things that get those nerves excited. Awesome. So go beyond heat to thermal. They get excited by dangerous heat and dangerous cold. Right, so that would be one. What else? Pressure and stretch, which have a lot to do with asana practice. Right, so they get excited by mechanical forces. They're potentially dangerous. And what would the third one be? That's the harder one. So if we give you the third, there's mechanical, there's thermal, and the last one is chemical. So the chemicals that get these excited, there's two main groups. There's the chemicals of inflammation, but they also get excited by the chemicals that come out of broken cells. So if you tear a muscle or cut your skin or bulge a disc or do any damage to any part of your body, or even stick a pin in you, some of the cells of your body will break and they'll release chemicals so that immediately what can happen is those nerves can send a signal up towards the spinal cord and towards the brain. Does that make some sense? You don't want to have to wait for the inflammation to happen before you would, for these nerves to send off. And so when they send off a signal, we say they don't send pain signals because pain, si pain is something, actually make sure you get this, pain is something that your brain produces to protect you. The body does not send, in terms of biology, the body does not send pain signals from the body to the brain. The body sends danger signals or warning signals to the brain, and it's up to the brain to come up with, is it so dangerous that you get to experience pain? Does that make some sense? Sometimes you do something to your body and signals go from your body to your brain, but you don't have pain because your brain may decide you're busy. Right? Or your brain may say there's something more important going on, or there may be uh, just not enough signals, which happens sometimes. All right, so the way that it goes, too, is that you have nerves in your body, then you have nerves in your spinal cord, then you have nerves in the brain. So it's actually a relay system. So uh, we used to think, that, of course, that there are wires that start from your body and they go all the way up to your brain. So the signal is sent all the way up to your brain without being changed. But what we know is that the signals get changed all the way along the way. So if this nerve down the bottom here gets excited and it sends a message up, it releases chemicals into the spinal cord to try to get the spinal cord excited. If enough chemical comes in the spinal cord, then the nerves there get excited. Then they'll send the message up towards the brain and then chemicals go into the brain to try to get the brain excited. You sort of get this idea? Is that sometimes the signal goes along, there's not enough to s continue to send it along. But the really key thing for you to understand about this is that the fact that it works like this means that we can actually change the signal. 
So when we are experiencing pain, we could change the signal by changing what's happening in the body, but we could also change the signal going up by changing what's happening at the spinal cord, and we could change it by what's happening up in the brain. Right? And we'll talk more about that in, in the, the talks tomorrow and the next day, but it's really key to understand is that pain is something that we can change in many different ways. And there's actually way more hope around pain than most people seem to think. Um, as an example of this, if I, if I bang my, my arm and danger signals are going up towards my brain and I'm feeling pain, if I were to do something like this and rub my skin like this, when I rub my skin like this, I'm ex actually exciting other nerves in my skin. They're sending different signals up to my spinal cord that put a different chemical into that little gap in the spinal cord. The, the signals from this, the neurotransmitters that come out when I do this, tell the nerves in the spinal cord, calm down, everything is okay. Whereas if when I bang my arm, the nerves in the spinal cord are trying to get excited to send the message up. Everybody got that okay? That's what heat can do. That's what ice can do. Right? So if you bang your arm really hard and it hurts a lot and your mom came along and gave you a kiss and that felt better, that's actually working up at the brain level, not at the spinal cord level. Right? We know the chemistry would be happening more there. Anyway, so it, it's quite a complex thing. We could spend days talking about how this works. But it's, in, it's important for us as yogis to understand is that you can change this at different points. You can change it through the system, not just change it with your brain and not just changing it with your body. So danger messages are coming from your body, alerting your brain to what's happening down your body. But what your brain needs to do with danger messages, like everything, is, is decide what's really going on. Your brain needs to interpret it. And of course, that's part of what we do with yoga is try to, try to discern this a little bit better, try to understand what's really happening. But our brain's job is to um, actually take detail out for us. That's the way it normally works, take detail out and just sort of give you this experience. So when danger signals are going from your body to your brain, they need to go up with your fight-flight system, your hormone system, your immune system. Your brain's getting information from all the rest of the stuff, right? All your external senses, thoughts, emotions, memories, experiences, everything. All that information is going to your brain at the same time. And what your brain needs to do with all that information is that. Your brain needs to come up with a sensible story. And sometimes the sensible story that your brain comes up with is not so sensible after all. I'm sure some of you have experienced a pain. You're, you're feeling this thing, but then what's going on in your body doesn't really match up. Or maybe some of you haven't experienced that. But as an example, I worked with this guy one time. He said, you know, if I bend forward far enough, it feels like the muscles in my right lower back are ripping right off the rim of my pelvis. And he says, but I know it can't be happening because that experience has been going on for seven years. And there's no way that they could have grown back on and ripped back off over the last seven years. So here's a guy who understands that the story his brain is coming up with is not really making sense, yet it still feels like that. And that's just the more complexity of this thing, right? So what we need to do is one of our jobs is to try to settle. I love this from what Sri Devi talked about last night is we need to try to settle the lake surface so that we can actually start to, to get below that, that, uh, the story. So that the brain is creating this story that's trying to make sense of what's going on, but a lot of time the story it's coming up with is being affected by all the other agitations of the brain and life. And if we settle those things down and so the lake surface gets nicer, right? I love this metaphor, right? Then you start to be able to see them with more clarity. You start to be able to understand the pain with more clarity. Because a lot of times when we first uh, experience it, uh, th there's not a lot of clarity to it all. It's just this horrible thing that's, that's bothering us. So, I don't know if you can see that from way back there. But usually when you look at a picture like this, what you, usually, you get to experience is your brain trying to come up with a sensible story. It usually seems that when you first look at this, you look at it and your brain's trying to come up with how are her head and hands disconnected from her body. And then your brain usually jumps to the next one. Oh, it must be a mirror. And then it's, oh, it must have been Photoshopped. Do any of you experience that kind of thing? As you're trying to figure it out? And this is what happens when you experience anything. Your brain is always trying to come up with a sensible story. Your brain's job is not to give you facts. And I'll give you a little bit more information about that. So when signals get up to your brain, when danger signals get up to your brain, I want to let you know there's not a pain center in your brain. We thought that, but we sort of let that go close to about 100 years ago now. We actually were so convinced in the early 1900s that, that there was a pain center in the brain that people with chronic pain would have lobotomies done to them to try to kill the pain. But it didn't work. 
because there is no pain center of the brain. Pain is a, a process, or it's, a, it's something that a whole bunch of parts of your brain work together. Um, some people call it a neurotag, and some people call it a centrum, and, but it's just this, all these parts of your brain working together to create this. It's a, like say, complex. But we know that when you feel pain and when I feel pain, that there are certain areas of your brain that will get excited. We know this because of some, some physical therapists, colleagues of mine in Australia who are researchers, put themselves into brain scan machines and caused each other pain to see are there similarities across people. Uh, yeah, it, is, it gets even funnier because they tried to get it through ethics that they're actually going to do this to their students but the ethics committee wouldn't let them do it to their students, so they had to cause each other pain and look at their own brains and to see how they responded. Anyway, so there's certain parts of your brain that get excited. Uh, there's a whole different arena of this. So sort of down here in the bottom, in the middle here, these are a bunch of uh, emotional parts of your brain. So if you know things like the amygdala and the hippocampus and the hypothalamus, a lot of those areas of your brain get excited when you feel pain. Uh, this is the back of the brain back here. Your visual cortex usually turns on. So when you have pain, the part of your brain that has to come up with creating visual representations gets involved. I mean, think about it. Most of the times if you get injured, you will look to see what's going on or your brain will provide you with a visual representation of what's going on. And, and of course, that can be really troublesome. Because sometimes in the, the medical world, we tell people, or we show people pictures of big disc bulges. Have any of you ever seen one of those plastic spines that has that big red disc bulge on it? I mean, this is one of the most horrific things that we could do to anybody. Because disc bulges do not look like that. They are not red. They don't look like if you stuck them with the pin, they would blow up. But now you've been provided that person who has low back pain with a visual representation of brokenness. Right? And can you see how that would actually agitate the surface of that lake a whole lot more? How that would actually change the way the person was perceiving this problem now? And we actually know that that kind of information is really problematic. Anyway, up at the top of the brain here, uh, on both sides, there's the sensation and the movement parts of the brain. They turn on. This part of the brain here is really an interesting one uh, for those who know. It's the anterior cingulate cortex. Don't worry about the name of it if you've never heard that before. It's a part of your brain that has a lot to do with attention. And I'm sure you've noticed that pain demands your attention, right? And this really, really uh, messes with us a lot, especially because it's like your brain develops this narrow, intense focus on the pain at the expense of pretty much anything else when pain persists. It becomes hard to focus. It becomes hard to learn. It comes, becomes hard to concentrate. It becomes hard to feel your body even sometimes. That it, like If there's pain in your hand, sometimes all you can feel is the pain in your hand, yet can't actually feel your hand anymore. And if that sounds a little bit weird and you're more interested, we'll talk more about that tomorrow because it's important. If you can imagine if pain makes it hard to feel your body, how could you come up with a movement plan that would work? If you're providing somebody with asana and the pain, who has pain and the pain has disrupted the person's ability to feel their body well, it's going to be really hard for them to come up with a good movement plan. And so sometimes we need to address that, and the beauty is that yoga provides us with that. It's part of the practice of pratyahara and of meditation have to do with, with uh, being able to feel your body well again. Anyway, when signals get up to your brain, they say that two to 400 parts of your brain get excited. That kind of a statement always bugs me because I know a lot about the brain, and I actually can't name 200 parts of the brain. But anyway, a lot of your brain gets excited. They say there's a 6.7 billion neurons in the brain um, and that each one connects with 5,000 other ones. And I'm throwing these numbers out at you just so to remind you back to the first point is that pain is complex. Oh, well, by the way, I don't think I actually mentioned the really important thing to understand about that. If pain is complex, why are you looking for a simple solution? Right? And, but that's what we want. We want a simple solution to it. But the point is, if you understand it's complex, maybe you might look for a solution that has some complexity to it and, and accept that that's probably what we need to do. So pain is also very, uh, it's complex and it works on priorities, right? So make sure you get this. Your brain will pay attention to whatever your brain thinks is the most important thing going on right now. So it's possible that right now you're listening to the sound of my voice and not really paying attention to anything else because you're desperately hoping I might say something of use, right? That priority may be there, right? And, and so the brain works on priorities, not always your priorities. Sometimes its priorities are different from yours. Would that make some sense too? Yeah. Anyway, so 
I had a request to give you a story that I said here once before about this, so around priorities. So I worked at, when I was working with uh, up in northern Canada, there was a, a fellow I worked with who was a, a mining, he worked in a mine, and his job actually at the mine was a first aid attendant. And he was heading to his 11 o'clock at night shift one nice summer evening. It was warm enough, he had the windows down in his car, and he's driving out towards the mine, but he's driving far too fast because he's late. And you can't start a mining shift without the first aid people there. So he's trying to get there on time, and he's really going fast on this road. He came around one of the few corners in the road, and there's a car in his lane coming at him. And they swerve, but they didn't quite make it. They ripped right along beside each other. His car bounces off the other car, down embankment, smacks into this old tree stump. He, f he hit his head, and he figured he lost consciousness for seconds. But the first thing he noticed when he came to was the smell of gas. He also noticed that he was hanging his seatbelt because his car was like this, but the gas was his priority at the time. So he starts to scramble to get out of the car because he's worried he's going to get burned, and the car actually lights on fire before he's out. And so he's scrambling even more. He's able to make it out of the car without getting burned, but he's worried it's going to blow up. So he runs away from the car up towards the road, and just before he gets to the road, he trips and he falls, and he says he's laying there with his face in the dirt, and nothing's really making sense rolls over on his back and he sits up, figures he's far enough away from the car that if it did blow up, he'd be okay, and it never did, it just burned. He now checks himself out. And when he checks himself out, he realizes he doesn't have this arm from here down. He was driving the car with his arm out the window on that nice summer night, and the other car took it off like a sword took it off. Now I got to work with him because they actually took him down to Toronto that night and they put his arm back on. They did one of those like 30-hour surgeries with three teams of surgeons. And I worked with him for every day for many, many months trying to get that arm functioning again. So he told people his story all the time. Pretty much everyone knew person he met, he would tell them the story of his arm. Anyway, and his story is much longer than mine, so I'll abbreviate a little bit. So we'll call him Eve because he was a French-Canadian guy and Eve's a good French-Canadian name, right? So Eve's in his car. He comes to this as sending massive danger signals to his brain. Everybody got that okay? But he doesn't feel any pain. How come? Priorities, right? His system has decided that if you know about this, you're done. And what was really amazing was not that it didn't hurt. What was amazing to me was that he didn't know it was gone. He got out that door of a crumpled up car without realizing his arm was gone, not with just no pain. Right? So it's amazing how our system can do that sort of thing. There are some actual scientists looking at where is it in the brain that the off switch is? Because it seems to be that our brain actually has an off switch, even when there's massive danger signals going up and the the current belief is that it's in the rostral ventral medulla in the old part of the brain, but I'm sure we'll find out it's not as simple as that. But anyway, so back to Eve. So uh, Eve, um, I just sort of lost where I was, right? <laughs> so this has been his priority. So anyway, Eve's outside of his car now, and he's feeling his safe. And so um, the amazing thing, sorry, the one thing I was going to tell you was when he fell, and he fell in his face when was in the dirt. The reason it was in the dirt is when he fell, he did this. Because there was nothing there, and so that's why he ended up in that position, and that's part of why it wasn't making sense. Anyway, Eve's a first aid guy, so what he does is he pulls his shirt off, and he uses his other hand and his teeth to make a tourniquet. He puts the tourniquet on his arm, and he knows to let it go every once in a while so he doesn't kill the rest of his arm. He's a first aid guy, so he goes looking for his arm. It's on the highway. He picks it up. He wraps it up in the rest of his shirt. This guy's a mining first aid guy, so he's seen horrific stuff, which is part of the reason he responds this way, right? Anyways, he's a first aid guy who's go looking for the other car, thinking the other driver might be injured and needed a hand, but the other guy was drunk and left the scene, and they caught him later on that night. Ethan goes and he sits down the side of the road, and he's waiting. Now, any of you are thinking, why hasn't he tried to look for his cell phone? Well, it wasn't in his car. This is 1984, so there's no cell phones, right? So he's sitting on the side of the road, and he's waiting because every single miner has to drive on this road to get back to town from the mine. So he's just sitting there waiting, and he's thinking, I wonder if I should lay down in the anti-shock position, you know, sort of on your side. He assesses himself, and he comes to the conclusion that he's not in shock. Then he starts to wonder, if you're in shock, can you adequately assess whether you are in shock? And he's having this conversation with himself. Well, the first car shows up, and the first car is a police officer, saw the fire burning from a long way. By the time he got there, the fire was mostly out. So it's dark. Eve's sitting on the side of the road, 
cross-legged, arm wrapped up in his lap. The officer comes walking over to him, and for whatever reason, the first words out of the officer's mouth are, can I give you a hand? (laughs) And he says, no, do you want one? (laughs) And the guy throws up on the side of the road, which, by the way, was his favorite part of the story. (laughs) And he told that with way more detail. Anyway, so... (laughs) Eve told us that within minutes of being wheeled through the front doors of the hospital, his pain went from zero to well beyond anything he thought was possible in the known universe. And his heart stopped. So it was a little bit like priorities again, a little bit like his system said, I'm tired, I'm fatigued, I've been keeping you safe. There's people here who will do that now. I have no idea that it had that conversation with itself, right? But it's like that happened, right? So back to that priority thing. Does that make some sense? Like that whole story to really drive home this point, you've all heard stories like that. But what you've always been told is that the reason the person didn't have pain was because of shock. And what I'd like to tell you is this guy, there may have been shocky stuff, but it wasn't big time shock. I was so confused by this that I actually found the paramedics who, who got there. And they said he wasn't pale, his blood pressure wasn't low, he wasn't slurring his speech, and he could walk just fine, which is not what you would expect from someone who has significant shock. So there has to be another explanation. And this is what we think is possibly the explanation of that. So it comes back to the complexity of it. You can have massive danger signals coming from your body to your brain, but if your brain is busy working on something else, you don't have to have pain. And you've you've all experienced that in small ways, right? At some point, you've said, where did that bruise come from? Or you've been working in a garden or on a machine, and you look down, you see blood in your hands. Like, where did that come from? Right? So you've injured your body, but you didn't get any pain. Why not? Because the system was busy with something else. That makes some sense? Think about that with asana. Right? You make your students so busy sometimes that there's no way... Right, you're making their priority all over this. Sometimes there's no way for that person to be able to actually to attend whether their body is really safe or sending danger messages. Does that make some sense? Right? I know we need to keep people safe, but we all, we have there's lots of different ways we can do that, and we'll like I say we'll talk more about that tomorrow. All right, so skill testing question time. This hasn't happened yet. This is a Canadian winter story. This guy's job is building birdhouses, and he's at work one winter day, and he gets a call from his wife, and she says, you got to come home right now because the pipes have frozen and burst, and the whole house is flooding. So he grabs his coat, and he heads towards the door, and his boss gets between him and the door and says, get back over there, finish that birdhouse, you're fired. So he goes back over the birdhouse, and now he tries to put in that nail, and he slams his thumb with the hammer. Is it going to hurt more this time or less this time? How many go for more? How many go for less? Anybody want to go for it? Could be more, could be less. There's no way to know. (laughs) Yeah, that's the good answer, right? doesn't really matter which way you answered. The point is that you know that how much pain he has and how much pain you have is always related to what's happening in your body and with how your systems are dealing with that. Did you get that? How much pain he has has to do with what happened in his thumb and with how his systems are dealing with what's happened in his thumb. But when we don't think about it, we often come to the idea that how much pain you have has only to do with what's going on with the tissue, but also has to do with how the nervous systems and every other part of your physiology are responding, which I hope that gives you hope rather than says, well, sometimes when I tell people in pain this, they say, I've got two problems? I thought I just had one. I just thought I had a problem in my body, and now you're telling me there's a problem in my nervous system too. But this is a, a message of hope, is that if you've got ongoing pain, we can help you with your body, and we can help you with how the systems respond to it. Right? In so many ways, we do that, we do that in yoga. I'm not sure if I'm making sense with that. Say it again. All right, so... Whenever you do something to your body, whenever you put too much force on your body, and if when you do it enough that you feel pain, the pain relates to what you're doing to the tissue of the body, but it also relates to how your bodies are responding to that. 
And so if that's the case, if all pain has to do with what's going on with your body and how the systems are dealing with it, that means that you actually have at least two doorways. You have more. But from just that point of view, you have at least two doorways you could go in. You could work on the body to get better, but you can also work on dealing with how the systems are responding. And if we went back to the, the, the metaphor of the reflection in the lake, we can try to ag- uh, decrease the agitation of the lake. That would be a way that we can actually try to change how the systems are dealing with this. Does that make a bit of sense? Let me go in a bit of a different way. Have you heard of the statement, pain is inevitable, suffering is optional? Okay. The first thing I want to do is point out to you is that if that really is a statement from the Buddha, I'm not so sure that the Buddha would have said it that way because I'm pretty certain that in Pali there's not one or there's not a word for pain and another one for suffering. And I'm sure you understand in Sanskrit, same thing. It's actually dukkha. In both languages, it's dukkha. But dukkha means pain, it means suffering, it means so many different things. So that statement could not have come from back when we only had one word for those two things. It wouldn't have made any sense. The second thing I want to get you to consider is that pain is inevitable. It does not mean there's nothing you can do about pain. It means that you are going to have pain in life. We do. It's part of living, Right? That doesn't mean you can't change it. But a lot of people, when they hear that statement, pain is inevitable, suffering is optional, they think there's nothing you can do about pain. You can only work on changing how you respond to it. And I'm here to tell you that that science says that that's not true, right? And people in pain, I would tell you, experience that that's not true. And if you started to explore it more, you'd see that, right? Um, Did that make it muddy or more clear, I hope? Anyway, let's carry on. So pain is inevitable, as we said. And as as I was saying, is that that doesn't really mean that we can't change it. It's something that we can change. So I want to give you a little bit more evidence around that uh, tonight and in the next couple of days. But I want to give you a a couple of uh, no one ever told you things. You can change the way the nerves in your body act. Right, the nerves in your body that pick up dangerous things in your body, you can actually change those. One of the simplest ways to change them is through expectation or intention. Right? If you expect that something is going to hurt, it doesn't just change what happens here in psychology. If you expect that you're about to do something and it's going to hurt, you can actually change the physiology of the nerves in your body. Which think about the, uh, the other way around. Right? If you can actually if you're going to do a movement that you thought might hurt, if you practiced it through imagery a number of times and in your imagery of it, you imagine doing this movement with more ease or less pain or no pain, well, you actually, by doing that, you're not just changing the way the brain's responding. What the evidence now is saying is that it's actually changing the way the nerves in the body respond to what's happening in the body. So we can actually change that through, there's lots of other ways, but that's just one way to say that. We can change what's happening with the spinal cord. The spinal cord sending signals up towards the brain. When we put more information into the spinal cord from the body, we can actually change the way the signals are moving up uh, to the brain. We can change the signals in the autonomic nervous system, so the, the sympathetic nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system. We know that you can change that, right? Breathing is one of the most powerful ways to change that, but there's lots of other ways as well. Um, we'll talk a little bit in... Uh, two days about, about the importance of skin as well, which um, Sri Devi, I'm sure you'd be interested in knowing about the, the, the science around skin too is really powerful about it being a really wonderful way to change pain. And of course, we can change what's happening in the brain. Now, we also would say we could change what's happening around prana and we can change what's happening around spirit, but I was sort of sticking more with the Western physiology sort of views. We can change each of these things and I think that's important for us to recognize Because if you could change any of those, you can change pain and you can change outcome. And there's more hope around this. So you have some influence over pain. I used to have a slide that said you can control pain and that got a lot of people upset because control seems to be a very absolute word. Uh, But if you have pain, the point is that you can influence how much pain you have. You can change, you can do things on purpose that would actually give you more pain and you could do things on purpose that would give you less pain. And we'll talk more about how to do those things tomorrow. This is a visual illusion. 
So I'm hoping you can see it from way back there. These, it's the same picture, but the one that's on the right over here just has these two gray bars. So I don't know if you can see from way back there, but there's a square right there that has an A on it, and there's a square right there that has a B on it. And I'm guessing for most of you, the A square looks a lot darker than the B square. Yeah? If you were to look over this same picture, it's the same one, but with these got bars, if you follow those bars down and look across the bars and across A, those bars in the A look like they're exactly the same shade of gray. And if you follow them down further onto the B and look across, they look like they're exactly the same shade. Can you see that? Can you see it from way back there? Awesome, great. So what this is trying to show you is that your brain, once again, comes up with a sensible story. It doesn't give you facts. When you look at this picture over here, your brain sees the checkerboard pattern. It sees the shadow that's here. It sees the shadow and contour of this, and it takes all that information in, and it comes up with a sensible story that tells you that the A square is darker than the B square, and your brain is wrong. That's how all illusions work. Illusionists know the things that our brain misses, that it misperceives. Let me show you another one. The artist that painted this used the same gray paint for that as that. Now, if you're like most people, the top looks a lot darker than the bottom. What's happening when you look at this, your brain's seeing the blue at the top and the brownie gray at the bottom and the shadow and contour here, the shadow and contour in the center, and your brain's coming up with a sensible story that says the top's darker than the bottom. Keep watching it. I'm going to cover up part of it. It's the same picture. But I could be messing with you with my computer, right? <laughs> so what I would like you to do is this. Use one of your fingers in that orientation so you cover up right across the center and experience that. You would think that the job of your brain was to provide you with accurate factual information, but that is not the job of your brain, and that relates to pain as well. Just like every other sensory apparatus, pain works in similar ways to that. Isn't that pretty phenomenal? Now, I've got to share with you two other visual illusions because these are my two favorites. The next one actually is my very, very favorite. Those two tabletops are exactly the same length and width. Oh, yes, they are. <laughs> you can Google tabletop illusion, get out your tape measure, and you'll see it. Right? And I've looked at this uh, so many times, and I'm like, you, the one looks long and thin, the other one looks short and squat. They're not. They're the same length and width. Google it, measure it, convince yourself. You could measure it now. You know, actually, it's really interesting. Sometimes when I do this with people who have pain, there's some fellow in the audience who has a tape measure on his belt. <laughs> and if the, if the screen is low like this, I won't ask someone to do it. This guy will get out of the chair and he'll come up and he'll measure it to prove me wrong. And if you can imagine, what usually happens is this is the body language you get. This guy is sternly walking up, right? And he measures the one, and he goes and he measures the other one, and then you see <laughs> right? Because he's just shown that it's the same. But anyway, you've seen ones like this a lot, right? Or you've seen people do paintings on the sidewalk that look like they're a hole and you don't want to walk in that. That paint is not hanging in the middle of the air. That paint is on the wall and the floor. Can you see that? Can you look at it and not see the paint in the air? but actually see it on the wall and the floor. That takes a lot of work because your brain's trying to come up with a sensible story. Danger messages start in your body. They go up towards your brain. Your job of your brain is to come up with a sensible story. It is not to accurately tell you what's going on in your body, and that's trouble. What you perceive through your senses is not accurate information. I believe, and a lot of my teachers would tell me, that the practices of yoga help us with this. The practices of yoga move the veils away. They allow us to discern more accurately, to be able to see beyond these illusions that, that our brain creates for us, that the world creates for us. So if pain's not an accurate indication of what's happening in your body, we got a bit of a problem with asana, which we'll talk a lot about tomorrow. Because a lot of you will have heard people say things like, use pain as your guide. Pain will tell you when to stop. Right? Well, it's not accurate. So we need to come up with a better solution. And can you understand if we go back to that? If pain's complex, that's a pretty simple sort of idea. Use pain as your guide. Right? We probably have to come up with other ideas of what to do. So 
Have you had brain freeze before? All right. Is the intensity of pain and brain freeze an accurate indication of how badly your body is damaged? No. Is the location of pain and brain freeze an accurate indication of where the problem is? Is that a good protection mechanism? <laughs> okay, a little bit of uh, neck asana. What I want you to do is do this and smile. Is that a good protection mechanism? <laughs> yeah. What's the job of a protection me mechanism? To get you to stop or change your behavior. Remember that from the beginning? Right? So one of the, jo the biological job of pain would be protection. So is that a good protection response? Yes, it is. Now, there's two reasons why you said no when I asked you that question. Once is because, or the one reason is because I got you to answer no twice before that in a row. And so that means you're more likely to say no in the third time. But the other reason is because you are thinking that the job of pain is to accurately tell you where the problem is, what the problem is, and how bad it is. And that's not its job. It's not its biological job. The job of pain is not to accurately tell you where the problem is, what the problem is, how bad it is. Its job is to get you to change your behavior. And that becomes really, really important if you take that idea further, right? Because maybe this physical pain that we feel and maybe this emotional pain we feel, its job is to motivate you to do something to actually find your true nature. Right? Maybe it's something more like that than just to change your physical behavior. Right, which we'll talk a little bit more about in the next couple of days. So if pain's not an accurate indication of what's happening in your body, what the heck are you supposed to do with that information? Well, we're going to talk a lot more about that tomorrow in terms of the movement side because I think that's a, a key thing for us as, as yoga practitioners and yoga teachers to be able to understand that more. So I, I just told you a whole lot of information. If you want to hear a talk like this, it's free. It's on the Internet. I have a website. This is called lifeisnow.ca. It's not life is snow, it's life is now. And it's not .com, it's .ca. But if you go there and you look down the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, there's a thing that says first five steps free. And the first step is knowledge. And if you look at the bottom of that, there's two short videos, but if you scroll down to the bottom, there's three longer videos that together make up about two hours worth of information on this called Empowering Self-Management of Pain. And it's there. You can watch as many times as you want to. It's free. It's, it's this kind of information because I know that, that when we hear this, we need to hear it a bunch of times because I'm not sure if you recognize that what I actually just did in a way was challenge your beliefs. And when someone comes up in front of you and you've got this belief about pain and they start to tell you about a different way to think about it, sometimes it's hard to take that in. Sometimes you need to hear that a number of times. Um, so you can go back there and check it out. And so tomorrow we'll be talking specifically, the talk is, is about uh, the present of movement. We'll be talking about how movement is such a powerful thing to do when we do have pain, but also how to do it so we can move with more ease. Um, and uh, the times when we want to avoid things and the times when we do want to move forward. So we'll try to tackle that tomorrow with the idea of, if those of you who are yoga teachers think about the student comes up to you and says, hey, when I do this, I feel pain. What should I do? What I want to do is give you an answer for that. Or if you're, you're practicing asana and you're feeling pain and you're not quite sure what to do, it's not changing like you might expect, I want to help you give, give you some more answers around other options you could do when that happens. So thanks again for your attention and thanks again, Sri Devi. <laughs> Did you want to give time for questions or we can do that tomorrow and the next day? <coughs> Five, minutes. Five minutes. If anyone has any questions. The mic, yeah. Ah, the mic. Right there. Anybody have any questions they want to ask? Oh, got a couple coming up. Um, 
Thanks. That's very good. You were very good at explaining things. So I wondered if you could explain referred pain. Okay. This is actually, yeah, so referred pain is, is, is the experience of feeling pain somewhere where there's not an injury. And there's more than one, like all pain problems, there's, there's more than one explanation. Uh, one of the one of the ways to explain it that, that can happen is that uh, to understand that your brain actually has maps of your physical body. So and those maps are actually more regional than they are specific. So um, your brain has a really quite detailed of map of your hands and your face and your feet. So you don't usually get referred pain when it's in your hand. You usually can really identify where it is. But when a, when a signal comes from your back up towards your brain, say something happened around your spine or your neck, when the signal comes up to your brain, your brain actually doesn't have a very good map of that part of your body. Your actually, brain actually has a really horrible map of the internal bits. The brain's got a really nice map of your skin, but as soon as you get below the skin, there's not a really great map. So the signal actually comes from your body up towards your brain, and your brain's got sort of an idea where it is, but it's like, oh, where is that from? And the brain really, once again, does the sensible story bit. It comes up with its best guess. And so neurologically, some of the parts of your body have connections, like oh, the nerves from your legs are all going up through your spine, and if the signals are coming up from there, the brain could say, oh, well, I'm not sure where it is, but it seems to be coming from down there, and those nerves came from down there, so I'm going to give you the pain there. Uh, so it's, it's, it's more, you can think of it as more the sensible story confusion of the brain based on our understanding of brain uh, physiology and architecture. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. It was really interesting. I know it's sort of a complex topic, but I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, you know, uh, fibromyalgia and the kind of pain that experienced right. in that respect. Yeah, right. That's a really big topic, fibromyalgia. That's okay. We can talk about it a bit. So, um, from a biological perspective, what we would we say is we've got a pretty good understanding of what's happening when you do have fibromyalgia. That there are multiple hypersensitivities within your physiology that not your immune system tends to be hypervigilant, hypersensitive. The nervous system that has to do with danger things are certain ways your brain acts shows that same hypervigilance. But you can also start to get it even, and it seems to be almost within you know the changes in breath and the changes in digestion and the connections with irritable bowel syndrome and all those things. It's like that those hypersensitivities expand even further. One of the things that we wonder about too is that the fatigue aspect of fibromyalgia is the fatigue another protective response? Because you can imagine, you may not need to imagine if you're asking this question, but you can imagine people who start to feel this diffuse pain over their body that's moving around and unexpected, um, that typically what we do is we just carry on, right? So what we try to do is we try to just push it down, push it aside, because it doesn't seem to make sense, and we just carry on. And if that is a message that has to do with trying to get you to change your behavior, but you haven't, it's possible that the fatigue aspect of it relates to a, more of a protective response. Mm -hmm. Yet at the same time, because fibromyalgia has a massive influence on the immune cells, the way the immune system works, we can't rule out the fact that it would be that as well, that the fatigue may be both protective response and immune system changes it the same way. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't seem to know about fibromyalgia is why, right? So there's... There, I'm, my guess, and I'm not trying to be egocentric, I just mean my guess would be, is that there's multiple reasons for it, can ha for it to happen, that there's not one. Although some people have tried to attribute it to trauma as a global thing or to uh, um, psychological issues. Yes, they're involved. Anything that drives the hypervigilance of the nervous system seems to be potential for bringing this on. Uh, but we we can't really pinpoint it as one thing, which is part of the reason why it's a syndrome. Yeah. So fibromyalgia is not a diagnosis; it's a syndrome. Means that we see this stuff that happens in people, um, and we don't fully understand it. Now, the really really fascinating thing I want to throw in at, at the end of this is that around fibromyalgia, there absolutely is hope, and yoga is once again proving to be one of the most effective paths for helping people in different ways. And um, actually just having great conversations in the last few days about the idea of fibromyalgia and that um, 
some people with fibromyalgia need to go to restorative yoga, yin yoga, something really low level. Um, and that may be because of the vata pushing it. It may be because of that anxiety of it. There's, there's lots of reasons we might consider that from yoga. But what's really fascinating is some people with fibromyalgia need to go to a energetic class. And there's some people who have actually come to me and said, I tried, this one lady said, I tried all the Mambi Pambi, lay down, relax, feel good yogas, and it didn't work. I didn't get better until I went to Bikram yoga, and that is what's made me feel better. And I've actually met other people, not a lot, but some people who've actually gone to Ashtanga, and that's where they found that that asana practice has actually gotten them to places they never could get, which would suggest, once again, that there's not one fibromyalgia. But then we could actually, what Sri Devi was talking about last night, maybe it also has to do with the nature of the individual. It's not just the nature of fibromyalgia, mm -hmm. but maybe the nature of fibromyalgia is diverse, but then there's the nature of the person as well. Right? And it really, all that comes back to this. This is such a wildly complex thing. And in the medical world, we want to say, this is what it is, and this is what we should do. And we miss the fact of paying attention to the actual nature of the person's condition of fibromyalgia and the nature of the person. Yeah. I hope thank that helped a bit. Yes, yes, thank you. Right. Thanks.